Well, I get started, Terry. Um, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to session three, uh, performance-based st standards. Um, I'm Carl Shaw, um, engineer at HBR for about five years, and I've Kerry with me here who will um, uh, focus on the presentation. Um, this session will also be recorded. Um, if there's any questions similar to the previous sessions, feel free to submit them, and we'll probably answer them at the end uh, of the presentation. And if you do submit them, just make sure, uh, relevant to a slide, just make sure you give us the slide number in the question as well. Right. So I'm Kerry Bader, Principal Engineer uh, at the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator with freight and supply chain productivity area. Um, been with the NHVR about eight years and dealing with heavy vehicles and probably 30 years. So later on now, Chief Engineer, Les Bruiser. Um, he's in a meeting at the moment, but he will be probably available in the question session. And he's actually a world-recognised um, leader or expert in the PBS and has been involved in it from the very early days with his, when he was working both at ARB and also at uh, team up or transport main roads Queensland so hopefully you'll be able to join us later if not we'll, uh, put any questions we can't answer all right. okay so what is the performance based standard scheme or PBS for short not pharmaceutical benefit schemes so that's these are things we'll look at we'll look at the history we'll look at the vehicles we'll look at process and we'll go to questions. Now yeah, there's a fair few slides in this but a lot of uh, pictures of vehicles so hopefully we'll get through and have, allow plenty of time for questions at the end. What is PBS? It's an acronym for Performance Based Standard Scheme. It aims to maximise the safe use of high productivity vehicle by matching vehicles to the road. So it's the most progressive heavy vehicle design scheme in the world. Um, it's an alternative regulatory system, so it's another way of complying with the national law. And the PBS requirements are set out there. And PBS vehicles are class two restricted access vehicles. Uh, world's first scheme of this type where they um, operate vehicles or allow vehicles on the road based on how they perform rather than what they look like or how they're configured and it was introduced in Australia and we'll go back through the history. There's nationally agreed there's 13 safety and four infrastructure standards under the PBS scheme which we will uh, discuss later in details and it says four matched vehicle access levels, levels one to four with levels two, three, and four having subgroups. Yep, so in the um, previous session, um, sessions, we spoke about the classes of vehicles, so class one, class two, class three. PBS fits into class two. Yeah. And class two is basically freight vehicles. Yep, so it's similar to yeah, your vehicles. Right, and things like that. Uh, and PBS is just a separate category in class two. Okay. So what does PBS do? It specifies what a vehicle must do. So it must be able to fit in and operate safely within the available road space. So the standards say it had performance must mean it fits on this size road and is able to safely operate. But the thing is they can be optimised for specific freight tasks. They can be exempted from some prescriptive standards, internal dimensions, length, width, height, internal dimensions. We'll talk about the exemptions available. We have a bit of a little video here and it's looking at the turning paths of a for a number of different vehicles. Um, so it's basically comparing some prescriptive vehicles, standard semi-trailer, VW, etc., with some specifically designed PBS vehicles that are built task specific for um, carriage of milk. And so their operation is focused on manoeuvrability. They're able to, because they've got to be able to access farms to collect the milk. And they're also modulating that they're uh, 
why move us any um, trial accommodation so they can break up to go and pick up loads and they work on a progressive loading thing so you load up different sections and then you to keep your weights down to make it suitable to operate on the area. So we'll have a look at some of them. First off, the standard semi doing this turn. As you can see, it goes around there, and just clips the semi line there. Now you've got a 19 metre B double. It cuts in a fair bit. This is a 20 metre AB double. So it's got very similar performance to the 19 metre semi. 25 metre B double coming in, and now we're looking at a 26 metre A double, and these have got steerable dollies that in it, and it has the same path as the standard tanker. So, by increasing the number of um, articulation points and putting steerable axles in here, um, that vehicle is able to perform with the same swept path as a 90 metre vehicle. So. That's the idea of PBS. You design the vehicle to be able to do the task that you want to. And that's, in this case, as you saw, they're modulars so they can leave a trailer, go to their pickups with the first trailer, and then do the rest of the pickups, hook up the trailer again. All right. So that's what PBS is for. It's basically for task specific functions. Timeline. The MHVR didn't invent PBS, we just administered it and have been doing since January 2013. Way back in 1999, um, the development commenced for PBS or performed base standards commenced as a joint NRTC, NTC. You know. NRTC was the National Road Transport Commission, which is a forerunner of the existing National Transport Commissions and they work with an off-road project. So 2003, the Australian Transport Council approved an interim PBS framework, so a framework around the development of PBS as a scheme. 2006, COAG, which is the Council of Australian Governments, recognised potential PBS as a major transport productivity and safety reform, and is really approved or said keep going on it and so that's you know those two things are above minister level or transport minister level so it's a whole government agreement to go ahead with it 2007 october ministers approved the pbs package and it was administered by the national transport commission and in 2000 the first pbs review panel meeting was held with the NTC. The first PBS combinations were approved in 2007, early 2008. Um, 2000, and they were administered by the NTC. In January 2013, the NHVR took over the administration from the NTC. And 2014 in February, 10th of February, I think, when the National Heavy Vehicle Law came into Play. PBS is actually part of that law now. So since that 2014, we've been administering and improving the scheme as we go along. So next one. So what is here is these are the prescriptive vehicles that you know in the law, in the national law. So you've got that the four levels of PBS performance based on so you've got a triaxle semi, 90 metres long, 42 and a half tonne at general mass limits. So the level one PBS vehicle performance was based around the performance of uh, general access vehicles. Your next level of access is your B doubles. So 26 metres long, 62 and a half tonne uh, general mass limits. The performance of this is where the basis of similar vehicles is the basis of the PBS level two performance. An A double road train, and while it's called an A double, if you haven't uh, been in its previous sessions, it's the type of couplings between the vehicles. 
So if you look at B-double, you've got two trailers that are connected by a B-trouble, uh, by a B-coupling, which is a fifth wheel, similar to what you see on the back of a prime mover, um, with a A-coupling to draw bar, a draw bar in a um, pin-type coupling at the back of the first trailer. So it's an A, and there's two trailers, so it's an A-double. 36 and a half metres, 79 tonnes, so that's the basis for level three PBS vehicles have similar performance to those. And next one's an A triple, 53 and a half metres long, 122 and a half tonnes, uh, general mass limits, three trailers uh, with eight couplings. So it's an A triple road train. So they're the basis for the four levels of PBS. Level one, two, three, and four. So we get a little bit more into that comparison. So, um, so it's prescriptive vehicle, prime mover semi, 90 meters long, PBS vehicle level one, they'll go up to 20 meters long, general access, B double, 26 meters, up to 26, level two, PBS, say, for levels two, three, and four, they have A and B. So A is up to 26 metres long, B is 26 to 30 metres long, over 26 to 30. Yeah, but the actual performance standards for a level two vehicle are the same, exactly the same for level A and level B. The only difference is when you're considering your Round assessment, you can need to consider the overall length, which stacking distances is intersections from railway lines, clearance times at intersections, and uh, overtaking opportunities on the open road is where the additional length becomes a factor, and that's all covered in, with the network classification guidelines. So double road train, equivalent level three, PBS, a is 36 and a half metres, so the same length, and B is up to 42 metres. Triple road train, level four, um, A is up to 53 and a half metres, and B is up to 60 metres. Okay, some fleet data. When we look into the fleet data, um, Level one, level one. So we, if we look at the P, PBS vehicles, if we look at other than level one and level two vehicles, you probably got about five percent of the total PBS fleet is above level level two, which is basically B double. So. The level ones will be things like point mover semis. The level one twos are your truck and dogs, which are by far the most common PBS vehicle you will see, and we'll discuss why later. And level, well, truck and four axle dogs. So, um, and level two is truck and dogs and B doubles, and similar things like that, and A doubles. So if we have a look at the pie chart, Level one and two, so which is basically 95% of the PBS vehicles on the road, nearly 92% of those are truck and dogs, and we're about 5% B doubles, the rest for A doubles in single articulated vehicles. So the vast majority of PBS vehicles are level one or level two, and truck and dogs. Okay, so it's PBS isn't a matter of having these massive, big, long, heavy vehicles. No. It's actually supporting movement in the smaller vehicles. Yep, and those truck and dogs at 91, 92%, um, majority of them operate under the national notice, yep. which allows them to operate on the respective PBS network in whatever state or yep. territory. Yep. So examples, some truck and dogs. So level one, PBS level one, 20 metres maximum length, 50.5 tonne gross combination mass. 
level two, 26 two A's, 26 metre maximum length. Uh, GCM is the sum of axle masses, so the more axles, the more weight you get. And we can go through that. And they provide flexibility and deliver substantial productivity benefits. That's why they're used. If I've got the top left there, that would be a level one PBS vehicle. So I'd get, uh, yeah. so it's a normal truck and set. So I'd get 6.5 on the steer, 16.5 on the drive, 9 on the first trailer and 16 and a half, but it'd be capped at a maximum of 50, we can't get back, 50 tonnes. So, all right, the next one to the right, top right, is the most common truck and dog we have around, probably the most common PBS vehicle. It's a three axle truck towing a four axle dog trailer. That can run at level one at 50.5 tonnes. It can run at level two at 56 tonnes. And yeah, they're, they're very versatile. They can be used for inner city work, um, cardings, mainly construction industry they use for that. Next one to the left will be a, a, the one we just talked about. It can be a level one at 50.5 tonne or a level two at 56 tonne and 20 metres long. The one on the bottom left, it's a single, a three axle truck and a five axle dog trailer. So this is more close to a B-double. This would be over 20 metres in length and have similar performance to a B-double. And the last one down the right hand there has got a six axle dog trailer on it. So if you look at its footprint, it's very similar to a tri-tri B-double arrangement. Um, just for the examples we're going to show in this presentation, um, I will share a chart um, along, so along with the um, presentation slides. We do have a chart available that shows these configurations, what levels and what masses um, are, are applied. PBS examples, this is a rigid truck. Um, um, it was specifically developed by for Australia Post. Um, by going through the PBS scheme, they could go to 12.74 metres long, which is um, greater than the 12.5 metres allowed in the regulations. It also has a longer um, rear overhang than normally would be allowed, and a gross mass of 27.5 tonne, which you can get on a twin steer, tender drive truck at him. But the, what they wanted was more volume, more loading space. So by going through the PBS scheme, they are allowed to develop this vehicle. It has got the same rear overhang, same swept path um, and performance characteristics as a regulation vehicle at 12.5 metres long. But it allows them to carry, I think, six extra bins of um, the postage bins they use to carry the mail and the other stuff. So, and therefore increases their productivity, but is has the same impact on the road as the other vehicles. Takes up the same road space, etc. And that's what PBS is for specific, mainly specific freight tasks. Okay. So, prime members and Semi trailers. So, a prime of a semi, I have 6.5 on the steer, 16.5 on the drive, 20 ton on the drives group at the back. Um, length 19 metres and generally loading of about 20 pallets. It's a general access vehicle, it can go anywhere except for a sign says you can't. The PBS level one is vehicle down there is a specified PBS vehicle. So recently the law um, allowed for a specified PBS vehicle, which says if you're under, you apply the PBS level one no, um, vehicle of approval, uh, you're running at general mass limits, limit maximum 
43 tonne, you can run basically as a general access vehicle at 20 metres long. So in this particular case, Woolworths are um, designing this vehicle. Uh, increased body length, which allows to carry uh, 26 pallets instead of 20 pallets. So it says there's a 30% increase in the load by going through the PBS. Um, going through the PBS scheme, which helps with productivity and makes your groceries cheaper, is the theory. Next. So we've got these things, and if you have a look at the axle configurations, forget what's above the axles. These basically, you know, these have all got similar things. So it's a, a single a steer, single steer group, then a tandem axle group fitted with, then a tandem axle group, then a tandem axle group. So if you look under notice, um, at 90 metres, 21 metres in Tasmania, and a gross mass of 50.5 tonne. Um, the first two vehicles, you should 90 metre B double, and your 90 metre truck dog have general access under notice. Your PBS level one vehicle at the bottom, uh, it's a bit longer, it's 20 metres long. If you work that out, it's probably got two and a half cubic metres more cubic capacity and a lot of vehicles are not limited by the mass they carry, they're limited by the volume they can carry, especially on carrying lightweight material. So um, sometimes they just want what they call a cube amount instead of a mass amount. So this vehicle they, to the road it looks exactly the same. Um, but they run on the PBS level one network under notice uh, and in some states that's general access, in some states that's not. So yep, next one. So the next one is a 19 metre B double, but running at and these are great uh, general mass limits. Again, 90 metres long, 21 metres in Tasmania. They can run on the B-double network under notice. A PBS level 2A vehicle, which is actually the same as the level 1 vehicle, except running at higher masses, it goes on the PBS level 2A network under notice. Uh, length 20 metres, gross mass 56. General mass limit 56. So, same vehicles. Same impacts or similar pavement impacts and bridge loading. So these are two different networks. Now, these are the same vehicles, but if you go to CML and HML, this is to point out that for these vehicles, because they've got 10 maxwell groups and the requirements around. Um, uh, how CML and HML is applied, they both get 57.5 tonne, whether it's CML or HML, which is some different rules around how they, um, what schemes they have to be in to be, but that, I think we explained that at the last one. Okay, next. This is a PBS truck and trailer, so it's a rigid truck and a five axle trailer. So, um, 23 metres long, gross mass 59 and a half tonnes. So, again, that gets the PBS level 2A network under notice, but it's very similar to a um, B double, 10 try B double in what the road sees. Next is the 26 metre B double and a PBS truck and dog and a six axle dog, so, so we've got a B-double length 26 metres, gross mass 63 tonne, it runs on the B-double network up in notice. This is a PBS level 2A vehicle, so he's, got, he's carrying seed and gravel, length 26 metres, gross mass, however, 
he operates under permit. So because he's not covered by the notice, because it only covers up to five bags for the PBS truck and dog notice only covers up to five bags for dogs. But looking at the actual configuration, it should have PBS level 2A or the B-double network. So um, there's movement afoot to move, uh, to look at putting out a PBS notice to pick up all key ones yes. and reflect the equivalent networks. Okay, so this is a PBS A-double. So again, it's two trailers. This is like that milk mover, the, the, the milk trucks we looked at before. So PBS level 2A, um, it meets the same bridge loading formula as a B-doubles required to me, but it's running at reduced axle masses to achieve that. So it's 26 metres long and gross mass of 70 tonnes, so that's PBS level 2A. So, yeah, the same fix as a B-double. However, if I want to load it up to the maximum maximal masses, 6, 16, half, 20, 16, half and 20, or me, I'm running at 79.5 tonne, and I become T2, so the same vehicle with different loading, um, this one now will be to have bridge assessments done on it before the route is going to run on, where yep. the other one should be able to run on the network. Yep. Now, PBS, what they call a 40 40 A double, so this is a 30 metre length, grass mass 79 and a half tonnes, so it's PBS level 2B because it's over 26 metres long and because it doesn't meet the the bridge loading requirements that would apply to a B double, it's a tier three or level two PBS, it's tier three at those masses. However, if that same vehicle goes on to a road train route, 36 and a half metre road train route, it would meet the, it meets the road train formula. So it's then a tier one PBS level three vehicle. So it can operate in two different modes. So it'll be, we we'll need the route assessor to operate on a V double route, but when it goes on to a road train route, it will operate as if it's a road train. So, and these things are very, very popular, particularly around ports, servicing ports and moving bulk commodities. So um, we'll have a look at the next, next yeah. slide. And explain why. Yep. So a PBS 40, 40A double can carry two heavy um, 20 foot or what's 20 foot? 6 meters? 8 meters? 6 meters. 20 foot containers. Two heavy 20 foot containers or two 40 foot containers. Mm -hmm reasonably loaded or four 20 foot containers so and if you compare that to a 90 meter semi trailer it can carry one 20 foot two or 140 foot 120 foot heavy 140 foot a b double because of the short front deck on it can only carry one 20 foot heavy container or one 40 foot container that's the same mass but longer. So for specific freight tasks you're actually using one prime mover and you're getting a productivity improvement of 100%. So you're moving twice as much goods with every movement. Now there's 30% average growth per year for A doubles. Uh, there's and the importance of them, there's been a 27, this is an example, with regard to the Port of Brisbane, there's been a 27% increase in freight numbers, but there's only been a 16% increase in the number of trucks that are going in there because there's actually a notice that allows them to 
run between Toowoomba, west of um, west of Brisbane, which is a major the edge of a major grain growing area, and also the edge of well where the road train routes come into, etc. And there's a notice that allows a, a doubles. 30 metre A doubles at tier three masses to run from Toowoomba to the port of Brisbane. So what that has mean, there's been an overall decrease in truck trips per standard containers, number of containers that are moved. So they're moving more containers with less trucks, which reduces congestion and all sorts of other issues. So that's been a good result and there's a lot of other, yeah. There's a lot of push to get these uh, a lot more access, especially with container transport. And this is a quad quad B double. So this these ones are mainly for container transports, mainly around the ports again. So maybe 27 ton on each of quad axle groove, 17 ton on the dry. So the 30 foot in length and 77 and a half tonnes, so they're a PBS level 2B and T3 um, because of the masses they're running at. So that's another example of a, again, for container transport um, where the PBS vehicles come to their own. You've got four 20 foot containers on that vehicle. The normal B double, you'd get a maximum of three. Uh, we're looking at an example of how PBS can you know, improve productivity and safety and reduce cost. So IOR Fuel Transport, they have a PBS vehicle that they, the bottom right hand corner, they have it running as a prime mover semi. They've also got a B double combination, which is the one on the bottom left. And then when they get out further, they join them into an AB triple. So it's an A coupling behind the first trailer, which is your semi. And then they hook up the B double combination behind that. So it's an AB triple. And the next slide shows some of the advantages of going down the PBS for them. So previous, they used B double sets at CML. So what they use now is an AB triple west of Toowoomba at HML, so west of Toowoomba. Um, east of Toowoomba down to Brisbane, where they pick up the fuel, they either run as a B double or a prime mover single trailer. What was the impact of changing to this? So they're going from Brisbane to Lyndhurst in uh, northeastern South Australia. So there was a 20%. 22% reduction in truck movements. So they went from 1,200 to 936 movements per annum. 42% reduction in truck kilometres. So they went from 880,000, 888,000 kilometres down to 512,000 kilometres. So they were improved safety, the dual steer. They were new truck and trailer sets, not the old ones. Um, and they have ABS, which is anti-lock braking system. They have the EBS, which is electronic braking system, and they also were required to be fitted with IAP as well. So they're um, yeah, so they're quite happy with the improvements that go into the other PDF path, and that's what they do. PDS is really you know, helps with specialised freight tasks. So you task specific vehicle that can do the job really well instead of um, using yep. another vehicle. And this is product and cost benefits. Okay, next. Okay, so this in concept, this thing's called an easy steer. It's used for taking longer loads in the logging industry. Um, but it's, it's a funny mixture of it's a prime mover 
towing a semi that's not quite a semi, it's you know, your, a dog trailer, so it's a really strange combination. It has different productivity impacts, and the impacts would be similar to a truck and a three or dog trailer combination, just the axles on the ground. So you have a look at this, and basically it's a manoeuvrability again, especially with longer loads, uh, for and moving around forestry roads and things like that. So let's have a look at this playing around. So you can see the front axle of the rear group steers, but the draw bow is linked to the bottom of the semi, so it's really, so it's, it's not a normal vehicle. So concept vehicles like this that are very specialised, um, as you can see, that's got a very good turning circle for a vehicle that big. But um, task specific, and that's what um, PBS is really good at. Obviously, there's a lot of money put in, put into developing and um, building these sort of vehicles. Okay, we talked about PBS standards before. So, We'll explain in more, more um, detail later, but there's basically, there's six groupings of standards, but the vehicle ride and handling one um, hasn't got any assessment against it. it. It had to do with what it felt like to the driver and how it felt like driving the other road, which was very hard to quantify, so it was, it's, um, yeah, it's not a standard as such. So the ones that do exist is the powertrain standards. So that's looking at startability, gradeability, acceleration capacity. So you know, basically how do I perform you know, through my powertrain? I haven't got a big enough engine, the right gear ratios, everything else to be able to you know, travel on the roads I'm meant to travel on safely. There's vehicle stability standards, which look at static rollover threshold, directional stability under braking, and your damping coefficient, which all got to do with how stable the vehicle is on the road. There's high speed dynamic performance, so there's high speed transit off tracking, reward amplification, tracking bill and straight path. And these got to do with some maneuvers at high speed. And then the vehicle maneuverability, which is low speed, um, performance of the vehicle at low speed, so low speed swept path, front of swing, tail swing, steer to high friction demand. So we'll go into that a bit further. So they're the safety standards, and then there's the infrastructure standards. So got pavement vertical loading, we have pavement horizontal loading, which isn't in the regulations, you have tyre contact pressure distribution and bridge loading. So we'll go into the look a bit more into the standards. And the first thing we'll do, we'll look at the development of the standards. So the standards development are looking at form measures for evaluating heavy vehicles and safety related movements. So it was an Australian project, so the discussion paper the methodology. Then they did an initial selection of performance measures on what they thought were important with regard to vehicle performance for safe performance. So well, then they went and did a characterization of the fleet. So they actually 2001-2002 NRCC and Australia's looked at the performance characteristics of the Australian heavy vehicle fleet. So they went and actually looked at at the performance of existing vehicles on the road in the, the different categories. So then they did definition of initial standards, looked at modelling systems, how they could be modelled, they had technical and national workshops, they did some studies, regulatory impact statement, did a final report, and the actual PBS standards represent the 85th percentile performance of comparison comparable prescriptive vehicles. So for a level two vehicle, 
it performed better than the worst case prescriptive vehicle using the same network for every performance standard. So, so all right, so next. So, powertrain standards. So, the first one is startability. So, on a specified grade, you're able to commence forward movement. So, I'm stopped on a hill, and for level one, I have to be able to start off on a 15% grade, level two, 12% grade, level three, 10% grade, level four, 5% grade. And this requirement is reflected in the um, network classification guidelines for the grades allowed for different levels of vehicle access. So the steeper the grade, the more restricted the vehicle access is. Gradeability is something a bit different. Okay, so it's about maintaining. So you're already travelling. You come up to a 20% grade at level one. You have to be able to keep moving on that grade and according to the level one, you need to be able to keep moving at 80 kilometres an hour on a 20% grade. Okay. If I'm in a level four vehicle, it's equipped to a road train, it's an 8% grade, I've got to continue moving, but I only have to be doing 60 kilometres an hour. So acceleration capacity, that's the ability to accelerate from rest or to increase speed on a road, and it's the time to travel 100 metres. And this is related very closely to be able to clear intersections and things like that. So level one is 20 seconds, and level four is 29 seconds. So that's for the time for the front of the vehicle to travel from, to travel 100 metres, it's not the total vehicle. So obviously if you've got a 53 and a half metre vehicle, you have to travel 53 metres, and a half metres plus your intersection with, but this is measurement of your ability to decelerate from rest. Oh, yeah. Okay, next. Vehicle stability standards. Now, static roller thresholders, they do this by modelling or I think there's still some tilt tables where they actually tilt the vehicle over to, to come to the point of it's going to tip. Um, it's a steady state of lateral acceleration that a vehicle can sustain during turning without rolling over. For all the levels, it's greater than 0.35 G and for dangerous goods vehicles it's 0.4 G because there's a dangerous goods vehicles aren't, aren't good outcomes if they roll over so PDS has a requirement in there for a higher specification or higher requirement for that. What the table is down the bottom we looked at those performance characteristics of the Australian heavy vehicle fleet that were undertaken 2001 two. So they looked at the static rollover threshold. So if you look down there, they range for rigid trucks from about 0.3 up to about 0.55. Buses and coaches, pretty high standard. Prime movers and semis again, down below 0.3. A doubles and A triple road trains, you're down about 0.25. Uh, trucks and pig trailers, truck and dog trailers also went below that 0.53 in B doubles. So the red line down there is a 0.35 that's required by the PDS standard. So all those vehicles left to that red line do not beat the PDS standard for general vehicles. And all those to the left of the yellow line do not beat the performance standard for dangerous goods vehicles under PDS. So by just looking at this, um, you can see that uh, the PDS standard provides better outcomes than the prescriptive standards. So prescriptive standards is really a poor proxy for safety, where the PDS standards actually assess the safety of the vehicle. 
So the next one is directional stability under braking. So this is basically when you, if you slam the brakes on, um, it basically measures how far out of line you can move. So level one, you have to stay within a 2.9 metre wide um, envelope or path. So um, in a 2.5 metre wide vehicle, so you've got about 400 mil you can move and it increases as you get longer, longer vehicles and higher levels. But there is a, most of these have deep compliance where if you've got ABS, EBS or load proportioning on your trailers, you've deemed to comply with that requirement. So that's why you'll find most PBS vehicles are fitted with ABS or EBS braking systems. Your dampening coefficient is basically how quickly if I do a manoeuvre, um, how quickly the rear tra the rearmost trailer comes back in line with the um, with the rest of the vehicle. So that's what a um, your dampening coefficient measures so you're not getting massive tail wag and that it settles down really quickly. High speed dynamic performance. So we have high speed trains in off tracking. So this is a sudden evasion maneuver. Um, Les likes to call Les Bruce likes to call it the dog evasion maneuver. So it's maneuver. So what it is is how far the back of the vehicle tracks outside the um, the path of the steer axle. So level one is 0.6 per metre and level four is 1.2 metres. So that's actually measured to see how much, if I do a sudden base movement, how much the rear vehicle part of the vehicle goes outside the line of the, of the front of the vehicle. Then you've got rearward amplification, which talks about the whip crack. So they do these measurements at the same time, doing the same manoeuvre, and so it's a whip crack. So um, how much does it flick back and forth over and above the um, the, um, the lead trailer? Then they do tracking ability in a straight line is basically when I'm travelling down a road, if I've got articulation points in my vehicle, it's going to wobble. The more articulation points is normally the more wobble, especially if they're A-type couplings. So again, this basically is a measurement of how much lanes, lane do I need to travel down the road. So a level four vehicle, your lane with probably need to be 3.3 to accommodate that. Uh, we're Level one is 2.9, so, and you, these requirements for trackability are straight line, and the other requirements are actually covered in the network classification guidelines. In that, if I'm level one, the level one network um, doesn't require as wide lanes as the level four network to account for these sort of effects. Okay, so what we'll do, we're looking at, on the left, a 35 and a half metre long A double, on the right, a 42 and a metre long B triple. So the one on the left is a 36 and a half metre road train, prescriptive vehicle. The one on the right is a 42 metre long PBS level 3B vehicle, and it's pitched down the bottom there, so it's a B triple, three trailers, B couplings. And so what we'll do, we'll look at the rearward implication on both these and we'll try to get them running fairly muscular. This is the sort of simulations that are run to determine, yes, you can see that. If you looked at the two of those, and we'll probably run through it again. Because it's got more articulation points and array couplings, the A double actually, as you can see, it runs off the path, so it's got more real wood amplification than the 42 metres. So this thing's three, five and a half metres longer, but 
much less real implications. So the performance of that for that real implication is much better than that prescriptive vehicle. And that's the sort of tests that are done um, when they're working out the performance of the PBS vehicles before they get us go through the system. Okay. Vehicle okay. maneuverability, this is the max width the swept path in a 90 degree low speed turn. Um, with these, all PBS are measured at a 12 and a half metre radius. And done at 12 and a half metre radius, where some of the off roads um, templates have different radiuses for different vehicles. So it's a 90 degree, and they only do the 190 degree turn. So they're the different performance levels. And frontal swing is how much the front of the vehicle goes outside the line of the of the um this swept in a math pass. And so it's basically the line of the wheel, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. Tail swing is how much the outside of the rear corn you know, goes out as corn turn commences. So when you first do the turn, the rear of the trailer will turn out, or rear of any or the truck or the trailer. Steer drive friction demand. Uh, it's an interesting concept. It's it works out how much um, available uh, friction you've got on the tyres to turn and then says, well, if you're going to meet the PBS standards, you'll not let you more than 80% of that steer tyre friction in there. And this is to stop you heading straight ahead at intersections and things like that when you're supposed to be turning. So, and it has to do with the mass drill. It's following you, weight on your steer axles, configuration, no longer wheelbase, prime movers, no, uh, try to push the steel axles harder than short wheelbase ones. So all part of the design of the vehicle. So now we can example of low speed swept path. So on the left we've got a 26 metre B double. On the right we've got a 30 metre long A double. So we'll pay play this one first, 26 metre B double. Here comes the swept path. It's the red lines. Okay, those red lines have been superimposed on the next one for the 30 metre A double win. And as you can see, 30 metre A double, because it's got more articulation points, actually has a better swept path performance than the B double. So um, that's how you can arrange your vehicle design to achieve the required outcomes. And that's just a standard 26 metre B double versus mm -hmm. PBS. Yep, a PBS, a 30 metre A double, level two. So it's got to meet the sort of part performance. All right, so that's just how they do it. Infrastructure standards, the pavement vertical loading. Um, now, the PBS standard, Pavement vertical loading is the um, legislative standards or prescriptive standards under the mass dimension loading regs for um, general mass limits, uh, concessional mass limits, and higher mass limits. So for that triangle group there, if they've got four tyres on each axle, or they've got two wide tyres on each axle, they get 20 at general mass limits, 21 at concessional mass limits and 22 and a half HML. So there is no difference between PBS vertical loading standard and the vertical loading standard at all. Pavement horizontal loading is to agree with horizontal forces applied to pavement. There is no requirement in the MDL or the mass dimension loading rigs in the law for this pavement horizontal. What the PBS basically says is once you're over a certain mass, 
gross mass limit, you have to have either a tandem drive group or if you exceed the limit for a tandem drive, drive group, and I think for level two, it's 85 tonne, um, you need to go to a tri-drive group so you're not imposing um, uh, too much forces into the um, pavement, particularly, and it's particularly on startup and um, climate rates. Tire contact distribution, so again, this then is the PBS specific standard. It just says you've got to meet the mass and dimension loading regulations, tire width and pressure requirements. So again, it's exactly the same as the um, as you would have in the um, mass dimension loading regs for a prescriptive vehicle. Bridge loading. So tier one, they use a formula. So those level one, level two, level three, four formulas relate to uh, MDL, mass dimensional loading rigs table one, plus some of the notices up to 50 tonnes, not even a truck, a dog, and the B-double notice. Uh, level two is the MDL table two, which is your B-double, table and MDL table three is based on those formula below it and that's for that's a road train table so they're all the same as we discussed in the last thing. If bridge loading if it's tier two it means you do a comparison so normally a line line beam analysis comparing the effects of one vehicle with the next vehicle with the vehicles that are already used in that route, that network, or that structure. And tier three assessment is where you start getting into individual bridge assessment. So the, the levels of bridge loading in the different tiers. Okay. PBS process. So there's accredited PBS assessors, and they have to sign up and get approved by the, originally the NTC, and now by the NHVR to make sure they have the qualifications, skills, everything else, ability to do the assessments. And most of it's done by computer modelling and giving results like we go there and we'll go through and we'll put a vehicle in. And we have some software here that we, we use to do assessments for around sometimes. And um, so you put the vehicle in, it runs through the tests, and come out with the answer and say it's this level, not that level, or it's another level, these are conditions. Um, what the assessor will do then, they'll get a concept from an operator, I want to do this, and they'll run it through and say, well, that fails this certain parameter, this certain standard. So that's when they start changing the configuration, they may change dimensions. Um, Tow bar, uh, draw bar links on trailers, things like that, axle spacings, to get it to perform in the way it needs to for the freight cars that they want to do or the routes that they want to travel on. So that's when the assessors come in. The assessor then spits um, the results of the assessment to the NHVR, and there's actually an independent pa panel called the, the Performance Review Panel, PRP which is advisors, is an advisory thing to the NHVR with regard to those vehicles that have been approved um, or been assessed by the PBS assessors. Once the design concept is approved, um, NHVR issues what's called a design approval, and that design approval says, we're happy for you to build this vehicle we're happy that it's um, whatever PBS level is it. It's a level 2A vehicle uh, with these masses and does this and does that. So that's the DA goes out. What happens then is PBS certifiers who are different to assessors. So the certifiers actually go out and actually measure up the vehicles to confirm that they're built to, their, um, built to comply with the design approval. So, and then 
if the information coming back says yes, it complies with the design approval, um, NHPR will then issue a vehicle approval, and once they've got a vehicle approval, the operator can apply for access. So they can have access under a notice or by permit. So they can use a vehicle approval as part of the uh, permit application. And that's what you'd see as road managers when you get out here through the portal, there'll be a copy of the vehicle approval on there. There's steps in place to um, simplify those to make them a bit easier to. So all that happens, um, yeah, and the VA is issued. Yeah, the VA is the VA is issued, and then the permits issued after the VA is issued. Yep. Yeah. And then the operator yeah, obviously applies for a permit yeah. with their VA. Okay. So, what responsibility does the NH? We uh, have in relation to PBS. So we do assessment and approval of PBS applications, approval of PBS vehicle certifications. So it's produced, so first part produces the VAs, design approvals, the second part produces the VAs, the vehicle approvals, authorization of PBS assessors and certifiers, uh, one stop shop for PBS vehicle and access applications. Um, we facilitate access for PBS vehicles with the road managers to provide the consent. So we don't provide consent. Uh, we maintain the PBS approval, we monitor PBS operations, um, and look at compliance with PBS conditions through our compliance officers. And look at improvements to the scheme. So, if there's a review of the standards going on, PBS 2.0 or something, improving business rules like um, moving them over onto the NHPR portal, the PBS is now part of the portal. So, um, we keep going. So, we're talking about exemptions. Um, there's certain exemptions that PBS vehicles are committed that uh, the NHVR can approve from the PBS. So, and it covers both um, Australian design rules or ADRs. So Australian design rule 43 has a requirement on maximum length. So that can be exempted and similarly length can be exempted under the MDL regulations. So ADR applies to new vehicles, MDLs regulations apply to um, in-service vehicles. So basically length, rear overhang, height, width, retractable axles, so there's a couple of clauses on retractable axles, tow coupling overhang and location. And the other thing, ADRs normally apply to individual vehicles where Mass dimensional loading rigs apply to individual vehicles and the combinations. So again, there's length exemptions, there's general length, trailer lengths, which includes measurements from the kingpin to the um, so internal measurements on those. Um, rear overhang, length of trailer draw bars, uh, width, height exemptions, and also tow coupling, attachment and overhang requirements. And one of those things in there is a road train whatever trailer draw bar length to be between three and five metres, where the PBS can allow to be shorter or longer, but the performance is still um, comparable. Okay. So we're looking at four levels of road access. So level one access, is equivalent to a prime mover semi-trailer general access. Level two, equivalent to B-double access. Level three, equivalent to a 36.5 metre A-double. And level four, equivalent to a 53.5 metre A-triple road train. So that's what the access levels are based on. Anything that come? Um, nothing, it's, yeah. I sort of support one of the earlier slides as well. Yeah. The competitors are prescriptive and PBS. 
So they match the vehicles to the road, so the better the vehicle performance, so level one takes up less road space, has better ability on grades, everything else, uh, faster across intersections, so level one gets the most sort of access to the road, generally level two gets less access, but it gets a little bit better access in level three and level four. So as the vehicle performance um, drops off, so does the access to the rate network drop off. So if you look at those four levels, general access, B double network, uh, 36 and a half metre road train network, 53 and a half metre road train network, uh, the equivalent levels. Route assessment. So the reason for route assessment is managing the road characteristics in according aspects of the vehicle performance that relate to access. So it's all about matching the vehicle performance to the road characteristics. So with something like that, you've got the acceleration performance, you've got your turning performance, you've got your road space requirements. So and then you look at road bridge width to make sure that overtaking provisions, entry length on the main roads and highways, approach visibility, vertical overhead clearances, so there's truck parking around, what's the road site infrastructure like? So you, you're looking at the route to see if it's suitable for the vehicle. Next. So what you do, you look at a particular route or set of routes, you collect data on that, you apply route assessment guidelines and you work out what access levels they are. So if we're a road like that, you look at lane width, shoulder width, grey, uh, traffic volumes, intersections, all sorts of other things, and it spits out the other end as a level one, level two, level three, level four, Suitable for level one, level two, level three, level four PBS vehicles. So you match the vehicles to the roads, or the roads. So the route assessment tools. So there's ministerial guidelines for making access, which have to be considered by road managers. The PBS scheme has network classification guidelines, which were endorsed by ministers. There's some PBS network classification guidelines for local government. There's the ARB rep rep tool. There's state-based route assessment guidelines, and there's been a number of new ones that are um, There's NOS roads, that's the current project. NOS roads, AP R6290 framework and tools for freight access decisions. So that's basically looking at what's available at the moment. Yeah, across Australia. And I think they made um, yeah, just showing what's available at the moment. Yeah. And part of Carl and I, one of the things we've got to do is actually go through the all those frameworks and have a look at their relevancy and how they interact. So, so um, real assessment tools is just talking to industry and talking to the operators as a road manager to find out what they're trying to do and how they're managing risks that you may um, may consider be, no, that may be there. So, and the other thing is if you can actually have trial operations or trial permits to allow you to actually observe you know, the proposed movements before you. So you may go through the network classification guidelines and it says, yeah, this, this is a bit, dodgy for a level two vehicle. However, there's some sort of industry that needs access and by improving the productivity, it'll help your your local economy or help your local people in some way or reduce usage of a different road. You may be able to do a trial operation to see if it can be considered. considered. Yep. So there's things available like that. PBS benefits, the main thing about PBS is productivity and safety, so 
say so Austria's reporting captive estimates would lend a benefit of twelve point five billion dollars by twenty thirty. Fewer heavy vehicles doing less kilometres to flip the frame freight gives you massive safety benefits as well. So just looking at this, um, uh, the chart here. So this was our Oswego report, wasn't it? I believe so, yeah. Yeah, That's true. yeah we got a little. Yeah. So the use of PBS vehicles has saved 2.15 million kilometres of travel by replacing. So, what are we up to? So, do, 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 do. okay. If we follow along that red line there, it's basically how many prescriptive combinations have been replaced by PBS combinations during that time. And there's been, so last year there was, you know, last year 3,301 non-prescriptive combinations. So in a total up the top there, there's nearly 15,000 prescriptive combinations being replaced by PBS combinations. The 490 up there is 490 million kilometres of travel saved by um, using PBS vehicles rather than prescriptive vehicles. So that's a sort of, and that's, that's annually. So last year there was 490 million kilometres of travel saved by, by using PBS vehicles. That's the idea. You use them, we, we use them normally for specific freight cars to improve your productivity and your safety. They, again, it's another Oswald's report, I think. They've been actually safety records. There's a around a 60% reduction in crash rates when using PBS vehicles. They're assessed and certified for safety, green braking. Many have EBS, we include the role security. So they actually, they're better on the road. Um, they get better drivers, better operational behaviour, and fewer vehicles, meaning less exposure. So if you can do, with the A-doubles, if you can half the amount of trucks you have on the road, even though each truck is bigger, you're actually um, helping with congestion and risk, you're exposed to the risk of having accidents, things like that. Impacts on community, so there needs to be community acceptance and support for PBS and high productivity vehicles and um, a lot of people do not realise PBS vehicles operating in their communities. Um, I'm sure anyone who drives on the cutting at the Warrigal Highway between Brisbane and Toowoomba would not, not realise how many A-doubles are running up and down that road. They look no different than the vehicle. Only four metres longer, so you don't really realise that there's fuel carriage way all the way, so there's no problems overtaking. So and so so people don't even know. Yeah. Um, you have a reduction in freight exposure and you get lower noise emissions out of operations and accidents. And Potential benefits reduction in road maintenance costs up to ten percent because with these vehicles, usually your most damaging axle on any of those combinations is the steer axle and the prime mover. So the less steer axles, so the less vehicles you have, the better off your your road your road maintenance um, should reduce or road wear should reduce. So. Um, and I think with impacts on communities, you look at freight cars and that just because someone uses a bigger vehicle doesn't mean he's going to do move twice as much. Well, if he moves twice as much freight, he moves it in half the time. If it's not a continuing thing. Yeah. All right, well, let's we go next. Supporting documents, we've actually produced a 
performance based standards it's an introduction for road manager which goes through the whole yeah, so PBS standards. Majority of the um, examples of this presentation um, are from that document on the left. Um, there's also another fleet report which um, I'll also attach to the resources um, if you want to have a read, there's a bit more information in there. And other than the transport from New South Wales is producing some videos on PBS. They've already produced one on eight doubles and they're doing a general PBS one. So once they're published, we'll, we'll probably distribute them. We'll get transport from New South Wales. It could be quite, quite interesting. The questions, I'll just start. Uh, there are a few, I'll go through them now if that's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, while I'm sorting through them, did you want to just mention the next session? Well, the next session is March 17, 2021, so two weeks' time. And we're talking about class one oversize over mass load carrying vehicles and also special purpose vehicles. So basically why we allow class one heavy vehicles on the road or why they've been allowed on the road. What is a class one OSIM or oversized over mass load carrying vehicle? What is a class one special purpose vehicle? A bit of history on the on the development of the uh, access arrangements for them over the years and so access management and current arrangements for managing those vehicles. So a question here, Terry. Um, it's about, so they've received a request for a tri-drive AV triple um, and they just want to know if there's any other, um, any similar vehicles operating on a regular basis, if there have been any issues with pavement that we've been made aware of. Uh, at each section, sorry. In at each section, it depends on the how the configuration of the trial is set up. Yeah. So probably give some more. If it's, it depends because there's different types of trial drives. Some sort of equal talk share. Yeah, um, I think we'll take that on notice. Yeah, take that on notice. Yeah. If you'd like to send us the details. Yeah, I'll be in touch with them. Can directly. Um, but there are some issues with tri drives, but it depends on how the tri drive is set up. Yeah. Um, another one here in terms of turning paths, are the level 2As better than the nine, than a 19 meter V double, and the 2Bs better than a 26 meter V double, or is there a way to easily break down the vehicle classes to work out which parts of the network they can access? 2As and 2Bs. Um, their performance or their swept path performance is based on basically B double. So they're better than the worst case B double. A 19 metre B double, because it's shorter, you know, will have a better, may or may not have a better turning performance. But a 19 metre B double is basically a general access vehicle. So it'll actually have a better swept path than a 90 metre prime mover semi because it's got more articulation points. But it'll have a worse swept path than a 90 metre or a 20 metre PBS truck and dog because the truck and dog's got more articulation points. So the 90 metre B double is a general access vehicle. It only becomes um, restricted B double routes when you increase the axle masses over 50 tons. Yep. So it's a case by case with the PBS standards. If it's a 2A or a 2B vehicle, it'll have a swept path equivalent or better than a 26 metre B double. Um, how can road managers assess PBS swept paths? when reviewing a permit application as they are available in auto turn. The, um, the PBS swept paths, which are available on our, on in the network classification yeah. guidelines, they are exactly the same as the Osroads general access 26 metre B double, 36 and a half metre uh, A double or road train, and 53 and a half metre road train. Yeah. Templates. 
I'll circulate those. I think they're on our website as well. Okay, so I'll, I'll send them out in the resources as well. Um, but um, just be aware that, yeah. So they're the same turning templates, but when they do the assessment on the PMF, PDS, they're all 12.5 metre radius. I think the Osprey's templates for road trains and possibly B doubles are at 15 metre radius. Yeah. But they have the same. It's, if they fit the 15, the um, Osprey's and a 36 and a half metre road train template. Uh, they'll meet level three. They'll be level three PBS vehicles. Yeah. Um, just a note here about sharing a link to previous presentations and getting a copy of this presentation. Yeah, I'll send. I'll send that all out after. Um, so another one here, Kerry. We have a transport company requesting 30 meter A double. Yeah. Um, but apply for the 35 meter A double. What are the difference in turning parts? 35 meter A double. Yes, yeah, so that'll probably fit into the 36 and a half. Well, one, one will be yeah. level. So. One will be level two, and one will be level three. So if we go back to the standards. So, yeah. so, so we're doing a 12 and a half metre, 90 degree turn, a level two vehicle. Swept so path has to stay, be less than 8.7 yeah. metres, so the level three has to be less than. Yeah, so the 30 metre A double would fit in, would have a level two requirement. Yeah, if, then, if it's been assessed at yeah, level two. And the 35 would fall into level three. Yeah, it's unlikely that it would go it meet the level two requirement. What we have as part of when a PBS vehicle comes in to get the DA or in the VA, we actually have records of the exact values and they're available to road managers if required. Um, another one about the turning paths uh, from Osroads and HVI, I'll send them out. I might attach the Osroads ones as well. Yeah, just have a, a link to it. Um, so another one is how, how does the road authorities know how tri drivers are set up um, is this mentioned in the applications? Um, interesting because there's not that many tribal lives around. Yeah. So, um, they'll be, they'll actually be in the application. Um, Maybe we'll look into that. We'll look into tri drives. Yeah. Tri -drive. Usually, I mean, tri drives are only used um, as a PBS requirement. You've got to, you're getting to some very, have you got the PBS standards? Okay, sure. I'll just have a look. All right. So just bear with us one second. Yeah, it's in the next receiver. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So this is about the try drives. Yeah, the try drive when you record. Um I think we'll we'll look into that one. Yep. Yeah. The try drives. Um have another one the, here. The PBS, the PBS standards themselves don't. I think when you've got to have a tri drive, you've got to have three driving axles. Yeah. You, you've got to have more. There's limits in the standards that says if if you've got a tandem drive group, so if you've got two axles driving, there's certain cap limits on it, so you'd have to have three axles driving. So it's whether it's equal torque share or non-equal torque share in that case. I was going to hear, um, so we have 
We have a network of roads in the industrial precinct that are all B double and HML approved. Yep. Um, but looking at the obviously the state roadmap on the GIS map, it only shows a few of these roads approved for PPS level two A and two B. Shouldn't they be the same? They should be. So it's a matter of it could be a matter of you getting a map and add it to the maps if you're happy for level two A two B. So you can do a route update request and we can pass it on to, to the bureaus to update their maps. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll probably get in touch with you directly and send you the forms yep. about that and I might have a look at the map as well. Um, there, there is a delay between when the jurisdiction give advice to upgrade maps when they actually do it. Yeah. Um, just see here. So there are a few more, some of them are comments. Um, there are a few others yep. that have come through the email, but I think we might just address those directly yep. and end it here. If, if All right, okay. no one else has got any. Um, yeah. So I think, um, again, if our details are at the end of the slide. If, if there is something specific, um, even if it's a permit application, we might be able to have a look as well. Is there any issues? But for any other questions, feel free to send them through. I'll circulate everything um, as, as usual. Presentation, the recording, um, and all the other resources. I think, thank you for attending. The next thank session is in much. two weeks. So I'll be invitations before we come out, maybe at the end of this week or early next week. We are trying to find a way to sort of manage it a bit better. Um, so you're not always having to register every time. Um, but if that happens, I'll let everyone know. Okay. Right. So again, thank you very much. Um, and obviously Les hasn't arrived yet. He's a busy man. He was actually yeah, he's in a meeting with the CEO. So. All right. Thank you, guys. See you then. Bye.